Please rise as you are willing and able for the reading of our gospel, which comes from the 25th chapter of Matthew, beginning with the 31st verse. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on the throne of his glory. All the nations will be gathered before him, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will put the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those at his right hand, Come, you that are blessed by my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you took care of me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry and gave you food, or thirsty and gave you something to drink? And when was it that we saw you a stranger and welcomed you, or naked and gave you clothing? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison and visited you? And the king will answer them, Truly I tell you, just as you did it to one of the least of these who are members of my family, you did it to me. Then he will say to those at his left hand, You that are accursed, depart from me into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry, and you gave me no food. I was thirsty, and you gave me nothing to drink. I was a stranger, and you did not welcome me, naked, and you did not give me clothing, sick and in prison, and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, Lord, when was it that we saw you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not take care of you? Then he will answer them, truly, I tell you, just as you did not do it, one of the least of these, you did not do it. To me, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. The Gospel of our Lord. You, you may be seated. Well, <clears throat> this is one of the most uh, famous passages. We're talking about separating the sheep from the goats, and so I have some goats that are going to be coming forth, and I'm going to give a little visual aid. So would somebody bring the goats in and the sheep? <laughs> Ralph, didn't we arrange that? <laughs> Did you forget the sheep and the goats? That's bad. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <clears throat> All right. Well, it's Christ the King Sunday, and uh, it's on our liturgical calendar every year. And here at St. Paul, we celebrate what we call Thanksgiving Sunday. We celebrate today knowing that the kingdom of God that Christ brought is a present reality in our lives today. We also celebrate the future kingdom over which Christ will reign, a kingdom in which the world will once again fully reflect God, the creator. Today, we celebrate Christ as past, present, and future king over all the earth. Here's a story of a pastor who, uh, after church, stopped at a restaurant to eat one Sunday morning. He was crowded and the server seemed really tired and weary. And after the meal and uh, the things were beginning to thin out, the pastor asked her, you look tired, are you okay? She told the pastor that she had been up most of the night with her little boy who was sick, but that she was okay. The pastor said, it must be hard after being up all night, having to stand on your feet and work so hard. She agreed. And he asked her, what's the hardest day of the week to work? Now, she didn't realize that he was a pastor, so she said, the hardest day of the week is Sunday. I dread all the people who come here after church. They make so many demands, and some of them are so hateful. And they never tip hardly anything. So I tell you this story because it's a point of discussion, I think. 
If the world is so full of hate and so full of selfishness as this waitress portrays it to be, then there's the big question. Where then is Christ? Where is this kingdom? Well, first, let's talk about where Christ isn't. Now, Christ is not in the nave or the sanctuary here at St. Paul, sitting patiently waiting for us to come to church every Sunday, 8.30 and 10.30. He doesn't hang out at St. Pat's or the UCC Church or the Assembly of God or the United Methodists, for that matter, or even the Baptists. Now, if we believe, if we believe what the gospel says, Christ is found alongside the broken people who are in need out there in the real world. Christ the King is the kind of king, I think, who moves around, moves around to be with those whom he loves and takes care of to see how we treat other people. Maybe Christ is one of those undercover bosses like we see on TV. Maybe Christ moves around in the world because he wants us to know and he wants to know how others are being treated in his name. Jesus said it, Most certainly I tell you, inasmuch as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. In other words, wherever people suffer, wherever people do without their basic needs, Christ is there. And he's not just there to comfort those who suffer, he's suffering right along with them. Now, yes, Christ is found in the Eucharist. Christ is found in the Holy Scriptures. Christ is found in our hearts. But are these places where Christ sets up permanent residence? We again look at today's reading from Matthew's Gospel. I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you gave me clothing. I was sick and you took care of me. I was in prison and you visited me. The reality is that Christ and his kingdom lives. But on the streets of Anamosa, the streets of Monticello, Cedar Rapids. You know, this past summer as I walked every day to the University of Iowa hospitals and clinics where I served as a chaplain, I walked underneath the bridge. It's on the corner of Iowa Avenue and South Riverside Drive, that circular walkway. And underneath there lives the uh, homeless of Iowa City. So every day, walking to and from my car, I got the opportunity to say good morning. And every night when I left, I had the opportunity of wishing them a good evening. Christ and his kingdom was there. Christ and his kingdom is in the soup kitchens. Christ and his kingdom is waiting at the Salvation Army to get a coat. Christ and his kingdom is in the hospitals. Or more likely, Christ and his kingdom is suffering and sitting because he cannot afford to go to the hospital. And yes, Christ and his kingdom is in the state penitentiary. Now, I'm not saying that Christ isn't present here, right here, right now, or that he won't be with us in a very real and palatable way when we celebrate communion together. I'm not saying that at all. But what I am saying is that the church is not the only place that Christ wants us to find him. He wants us out there in the world every day looking to find him in the heartache and pain that surrounds us. Imagine that. He wants us to look for him in the heartache and the pain that surrounds us. Our church is our community. It's a place where we come each week, more often than that maybe, to feed and to nourish our souls for the work that we must do as ministers of Christ. Church is the support 
and the place we come. And it's the place that nowhere else can we get strength that we need to do this ministry. Now, we all know that the act of coming to church, particularly to worship, can be a bit more conflictual every week than we'd like to admit. We get up on Sunday mornings and we try to make a decision. After all, we have a lot going on in our lives. We are busy, involved in, the, in our communities. We're raising our families. We're trying to meet the demands of work and marriage and very important relationships. Church for some is a place to go to see and be with friends, to reconnect and have a place to forget about the stresses and the pressures of everyday life. And that's a good thing. That's what church is for. It's a place for community. Now for others, worshiping is the more focal point of coming to church. Some will say, I come to church no matter what is going on in my life and no matter what's happening. Others will say that, well, they really feel they have to be perfect. They have to have themselves together to come to church to try to feel worthy enough to set foot in the building and that maybe sometimes they don't even feel worthy enough to come to communion. So if we say we are filled with the Holy Spirit after our worship experiences, what happens then when we leave here? Could it be that when we walk away from our time as a community, our time as an assembly who just finished worshiping and praising God, but feeling as though we hadn't quite been refreshed by God's love for us? Could it be that we just didn't feel it? Maybe we couldn't open our hearts and minds enough to hear the word of God that day. I think it's pretty realistic and okay to say that there are times when we don't really have the strength to give and to worship when we're in church. There are days when we don't want to give or we don't want to even acknowledge those in our world who are the least. So what happens to our strength? Well, you know, working for God's kingdom does feel rather futile. It's not just an uphill battle, it's downright unfeasonable. Even ridiculous to think that our individual and collective efforts as a church can turn a world around into the world that God sees that it can be. You know, we can see and lament the differences of what the world is and what the world can be, but we often turn our heads away from injustices that don't affect us directly. Recent shootings, natural disasters, terror attacks reinforce this attitude and it creates apathy and fear. It drains our strength. Mankind's propensity for making itself rather than God the, the center of desire and action is frustrating. And it's also our greatest weakness. All these things drain us of our resolve and our strength and our resiliency. The really difficult thing to think about is that these terrorists, shooters, and others that intentionally perpetrate violence in this world are in reality very lost souls, looking for belonging in a world that has rejected them. It's difficult to separate persons from the evil acts that they commit. They've come to know the world or God's kingdom as a hateful place. So rather than getting to know the God of love, they've gotten to know a God of anger and of violence. And it's the only way they know how to live in the world. So rather than believe in the God that we know, whose grace and acceptance are absolutely unconditional, they are drawn to worship the God of fear. I've heard it said many times, it's inconceivable to many of us who know our loving God that People who try to establish a kingdom through violence can't see that violence for what it is. It's a descending spiral 
begetting the very thing that it seeks to destroy. Instead of diminishing evil, it multiplies it. So when they can't get us to reject the violence, they feel they've failed. But when they can get us to react to the violence, they've done their job. Now, the problem with reacting to violence and violence is hate, is that violence, if you murder the lie, nor establish a lie, you don't kill the truth. Through violence, you can murder the hater, but you do not murder the hate. Violence increases hate, and hate can drain our strength, and so it goes over and over. Returning violence for violence multiplies violence and it adds deeper darkness. Darkness cannot drive out darkness, only light can do that. Hate cannot drive out hate, only love can do that. So Christ the King, that kingdom is so different than the world's kings because Christ is the one who testifies to the truth and then calls us to do the same. Now, in the Lord's Prayer, we say it out loud every time, Thy kingdom come. It is our calling to strive for different, and it is our way to collectively and individually be strengthened in our relationship with Christ. It is our calling to together bring about Christ's kingdom as a state of being right here and right now. It's a way to live. It's a commitment to a particular way to view the world. We gather this week to pray and to witness, to pray that God will comfort those who mourn, to be reminded of our call as disciples of this church and the church worldwide to be Christ the kings in this world, hoping that by doing so we can change the hearts of those who can see no other way. Now, in a little while, we will, during our prayer for the healing of the nations, we will pray for the people of these nations, our nation, who are still now trying to heal from the marginalizing that's done. And we do it to ourselves as well as victims from other nations as well. Christ the King wants us to love fiercely, even in the face of fear, and remember that his kingdom is only about profound and intimate relationship with God. Christ the King wants us to lift our hearts so that Christ's love can transform life here and now. The kingdom of God is not a faraway place, but rather the transformation of every place so that the glory and grace of God are fully evident. Christ the King wants us to help change the experiences of those like the waitress who sees only hatred. Christ the King wants us to be that kingdom where everyone is a sheep and is placed at the right hand, right hand side of God. And it is here where we will become welcomed by the Father to inherit the kingdom and to inherit eternal life. Amen.